Hey everybody, Adrian here, one of the co-hosts of Sidebar Forever, the new version of the former Sidebar Pop Culture Podcast. Every month, Sidebar Forever posts brand new episodes discussing and examining pop culture and art-related topics. However, as a bonus and a reminder to listeners who followed us in our previous incarnation, we're representing some of our vintage back episodes. Many of our classic interviews and roundtables will once again be available in our podcast feed. So, please enjoy this back episode from the Barchives, and don't forget to subscribe to Sidebar Forever on SidebarForever.com, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or anywhere else you get your podcast. And hey, follow us on our socials, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, so you don't miss a single new episode of Sidebar Forever. Well, nobody is more excited by the posting of our interview with the great one, artist and illustrator Greg Manchez, than Dwight and I. Greg is tops in his field, tops in his craft, and tops in our book for sure. His resume is lengthy and uber impressive. Book cover illustrations, magazine illustrations, concept art for movies, children's books, art on a grand scale, paintings for the Lincoln Memorial, Society of Illustrator Awards, and a U.S. postage stamp. Past clients, well, Time Magazine, Newsweek, The Atlantic Monthly, Omni, Playboy, Smithsonian, The National Geographic. We don't title this one Journeyman for nothing. This guy has been at it for 30 plus years, and he's still putting it down with much excellence. He's an Oregonian, but we caught up with him on the East Coast in New York City and had a great time chatting. He was warm, friendly, open, and we enjoyed a few laughs with him, too. Okay, let's pick things up with Greg discussing his art school days and some of the frustration he encountered as a young man pursuing art. I did not have a real good art school experience. Uh, first day of art school, and I mean the first day, right after signing the paperwork and signing up for classes. Um, I had somebody, one of the instructors um, was there. I was talking to him, and they said, uh, don't bother learning to draw or paint. It's dead, <laughs> and, and we're done with it here. And I, I was stunned. I kind of looked at the guy and thought, you know, I just wrote a check for 2000 bucks Back then, that was a lot. Yeah. And you guys took it happily, and now you're telling me you're not going to teach me anything. Wow. And I, I started to think, this is not good. So it set me up to be very leery of the whole process. And as I went through the school, uh, for three years there and one year out in California, I realized they really weren't teaching anybody how to draw and paint. They were mm. teaching them how to think. Mm. And you can mm. pretty much figure where that went. Mm. Uh, and a lot of it is, you know, at the time was conceptual thinking. Mm. Nothing but conceptual art thinking, mm -hmm. which was, you know, uh, grab a chicken, weave it into your hair, go outside and scream and call your grandmother bad names and see if somebody will videotape it and put it in a gallery somewhere. You know? And I just was not prepared for that at all. So I I became the avant-garde in reverse, I think, um, the way I see it in my head, was that I, I went back looking for people to teach me how to draw and paint. Mm -hmm. And I, I found some instructors um, here and there. Uh, I found an anatomy instructor who was really great at drawing and could could talk about anatomy, um, but then we, we mostly just sort of drew in class, and it really wasn't an education in how to draw or compose or speak or anything like that. It was just charcoal in hand, memorize, try to, well, they didn't even say that, to memorize muscle. I, I didn't even figure that out until about 20 years later. Oh, <laughs> slap the forehead and go, oh, we're supposed to memorize this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're always in those uh, figurative classes, and everybody just goes, oh, here's the model, and they put a light on them, or the fluorescent lights are there, and it's all washed out. There are no shadows. Right, there. right. And they just say, draw. You know, well, <laughs> okay. Uh, and half the class is just twiddling their thumbs trying to figure out how to put a line on a piece of paper. Mm. 
And uh, so my education was very much like that. Pissed me off. God, I came out of that school really pissed off. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I said, that's it. I'm going to, you know, go in, do my own gallery work. Mm. But I was always interested in illustration. Mm. And a friend of mine had gone off and gotten an art direction job at uh, Better Homes and Gardens magazine. I thought, wow, that's a real coup. Mm-hmm. And uh, she hired me before I got out of school to do some cartoon work for the magazine. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, that's that's cool. So I did some things. And she said, there's this great studio in Iowa. you got to check it out. These guys are really good. Mm-hmm. And I thought, Iowa. Right. Come on. I, I'm, I grew up in Kentucky. I went to Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota to go to art school. Mm-hmm. Now I'm going to Iowa. Right, right. I thought, oh, that that's it. Life is over. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I didn't, I, I thought, well, I better check it out. She, you know, I respected her opinion. So I drove down, I, I put a portfolio together of lots of drawings and, and as many finished pieces as I could and slides of my paintings. And I drove to, uh, Waterloo, Iowa. And, um, I had an interview with them down there, and and funny enough, one of the guys that was interviewing and was the head of the illustration department was mm-hmm. Gary Kelly. Wow, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> of course, that was before Gary was Gary Kelly. Yeah, right. right. The capital G <laughs> and capital K. Right, right. That's it. That's right. So I didn't know him, and, and uh, you know, he had no clue who I was, and and. Bob Hellman was there, and it was the Hellman Design Associates in Waterloo, Iowa. They had this great little house on a side street in a neighborhood, mm-hmm. and there were six other illustrators there. I walked into the place. They had a little show in the lobby of the house. It was an old house, and they just turned it into a, a studio. Mm-hmm. And I saw the work on the wall immediately. Uh, I was I was like blown back mm-hmm. uh, because the line work that these guys were doing just hit home so quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought, this is this is amazing mm-hmm. uh, quality work. One guy's, uh, the first guy that I saw was Bill Ursuline. I don't know if you know his work, but excellent, excellent drawing, great line work. And uh, I saw Bill's work right away and just thought, you know, I think I need to come here if wow. they'll hire me. Right. So I uh, went through the interview, and uh, they liked my drawings, and they said, uh, please think about it, you know, we'll think about it, and uh, get back to us. And I had told them I was going to go freelance and, you know, all these other big tales of right. freelance <laughs> illustrator, you know. <laughs> oh, I got lots of plans, you know. Right. I don't know about coming to Iowa or whatever. And I went off uh, for a couple weeks uh, to see a friend out in California. And while I was out there, I thought, you know, <laughs> it makes a whole lot of sense to go to this studio. Because mm-hmm. one of my instructors, illustration instructors at one of the schools, I think it was California, I went to CCAC for about a year where I met uh, David Grove, who okay. really was uh, in education all in itself to know David. We've been friends for over 30 years, and uh, mm-hmm. he's remarkable. Just remarkable, and uh, I learned a lot from him about the illustration business. But he only taught a five-week class, I think it was. Mm-hmm. And and there was another guy, Chris Kenyon, out there that that taught a five-week class. And mm-hmm. um, he just said, make sure that wherever you go after school, that you're not the best guy there, mm-hmm. and otherwise you're not going to learn anything. And his words just rang true in my head when I was at Hellman Design, because all those guys were better than me. Okay. And so I came back and uh, to Iowa and uh, called them up, had a second interview, and they offered me the job. And I said, I think I'll do it. And uh, they offered me 11000 bucks. <laughs> $11,000 a year. Wow. It was more money than I could even think of at the time. I mean, 11000 right. back in the, back in 1977 went a long sure, way. Sure. <laughs> first thing I did, the first paycheck, I went to the audio store and I bought a Bang & Olufsen. Oh, wow, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> went on the payment plan. I, it was a $500 receiver. Nobody even heard of that back right. then. You know? Right, right. I still have the thing. It's one of the pieces in the um, 
museum. Uh, it's in the Met under um, one of their. Uh, oh, they keep it in the uh, um, industrial design area. Wow! Seriously, so you have one of your pieces in a, in a museum? No, no. I mean, it's. I have the same model. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Greg donated his, <laughs> right? his to the Met. Right. Well, well you do right. have other things in museums. So yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's right here if you need it. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, nah, then uh, uh, they, they tried to get me to stay. I remember from the first day, I said, I cannot stay here longer than two years. I'm going to come in. I'm going to get educated. I'm going to do well. And I'm going to leave in two years in freelance. And uh, they they tried a lot after about the first six months. Uh, they tried to get me to buy a house and a couple of cars <laughs> and, you know, the golden handcuffs kind of thing. Right, and, introducing uh, you to girls. Yeah, oh, she's really That's nice. right, yeah. <laughs> and I just couldn't see myself living in Waterloo, Iowa. Uh, although Helma Design was phenomenal. It was an mm-hmm. island in the middle of... Um, not much art, I can tell you that, mm. other than Chicago, which right. was was three three and a half hours away, but uh, mm. or thereabouts, uh, a little longer than that. But uh, it was an intensive learning experience because every one of these guys were so good and still are. And here's Gary coming up, you yeah, know? yeah. And I was in Gary's room for a while. They were putting an an addition onto the house for an extra studio so they'd have space for me and, and actually Bill Urslan. And uh, I was drawing and painting with my illustration board butted up against Gary's illustration board in the same room for about three months. Mm. And uh, that was an education in itself. I'm sure. He used to talk about all kinds of stuff. But mm-hmm. uh, I watched his career blossom and I thought, hey, I'm going to try that. Well, you know, yeah. There's no competing with Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Gary's brilliant that way, so I had to I had to take a different tack. But uh, uh, so I spent these two intensive years learning just about every damn day. I was learning something. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I tried to avoid for a few months was using the artograph, yeah. which yeah. at the time was called a Lucy graph, it projected from the bottom up through mm-hmm. the tissue paper we were using, but mm. I learned later an uh, overhead projector was way, way faster. Right. But uh, I refused to use it uh, for the longest time because I wanted to draw naturally, and then I realized, right. you know, I'm, it, this is going to take a while, and yeah. <laughs> I need to keep up. <laughs> yeah, right. And so I promised myself, if I'm going to use this Diagon thing, I'm going to learn by it. Mm. And so... I credit an overhead projector for teaching me more about drawing and, and ultimately painting than any instructor, really, that I had. Mm-hmm. Because under that thing, I was training and I was memorizing and learning. Mm-hmm. And um, so it, this whole idea about tracing photographs is, is pretty ridiculous in mm-hmm. my mind. Uh, mm-hmm. To me, I'd like to teach an actually actual class on on tracing well and how to do it and how it can teach you to draw better Mm -hmm. so that's that was part of my learning curve as well Mm -hmm. with that and uh put it to good use and exactly two years to the day on memorial day weekend Mm -hmm. i walked out the door and went freelancing wow and uh At the time, I was making fourteen thousand five hundred bucks, uh, fourteen thousand um, dollars. Okay. And and uh, I thought, ooh, and that's pretty good. And I walked away from that kind of money at the time, and went out and bought a brand new firecracker red uh, CJ5 Jeep, oh. and <laughs> and went on a nine week uh, trip with my girlfriend up into Canada. Wow. Uh, without any work or anything, and blew money right and left, and came back broke, and went. Well, that was brilliant. <laughs> and started my uh, freelance career. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was, uh, you know, I just like to pile on the scary stuff, I guess. Uh-huh. And, uh, start from there. You're, you're a man who but, likes who likes challenges. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's just. I think it's inherent in the field. The competition in the field is just. Um, 
it's heavy. It's palpable. You yeah. you can taste it at times. Mm. It's like a really bad humid day in New York in the summer. Mm. Uh, but uh, I mean that, and it's been that way. The thing is, I figured out it's been that way since before my time. From since before any of our times, mm. uh, mm -hmm. illustration has always been intensely competitive, mm -hmm. and um, and I think that's how it turns out. Such such great artists, but it's not about the talent mm. to me. It's never about the talent. It's about the work. Mm. And they're finding now, I've been spewing that for years because I just didn't feel the talent when I was younger, especially going through art school. Mm -hmm. uh, I was I was cocky about it. Mm -hmm. I was determined, but f as for having some kind of gift, mm -hmm. no way. Mm -hmm. I knew I didn't have it, and I was looking for anybody that could tell me what to look for if they had it. You know? Okay. So is it the discovery of of through working through the process that that you're that makes things work so well for you? It's the process, absolutely. The process. Uh, to me, um, it's all um, learned skill. It's a brain function. It's not a gift. Mm. I mean, how many seventy year old guys do you point to and go, "Wow, that guy's talented"? Because <laughs> usually you're thinking, "Wow, that guy's had a lot of experience." Yeah. But it's all the young folks that we look at and go, whoa, they're talented. And and I see young folks all the time, and I think, whoa, these guys are talented. And I think, oops, you know, there's that word again. It's mm -hmm. it's something we can't explain right off the bat, but there's a lot of research now that's pointing to the fact that these, these skills are absolutely learned. And, it, you know, we think it comes out of nowhere, but if you really track it, and take a look at where people have come from. You find that they're putting things together at an early age or whatever, but they're always working hard. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I listen to some of the other interviews of, of the artists you guys uh, talk to, and most of those guys are talking about hard work, too, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of the artists we talk to definitely mention working hard and, and sweat equity and all that kind of stuff. But I, I do, I do want to ask you this as, as it pertains to gifts, because... Like, there are people that I've known in my life who, I have a friend, his nickname is Wizard, he's a musician, and he's a fabulous musician, and he mm -hmm. said that his parents told him that literally when he was a kid, I mean, a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, you could put an instrument in front of him, and in three weeks he was playing it, and then you put another instrument in front of him, and in three yeah. weeks later he was playing it, and it doesn't mean that he didn't work hard, but he mm -hmm. obviously, in, to my mind, and I think to his as well, felt like he had just a gift at a very early age. Certainly it needed cultivating, but he did have a gift right? or an aptitude. He, he had something, I'll tell you. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that kind of blows my, my argument out, out of the water uh, a lot when we find these guys. like oh, You've probably seen those, those kids are like four years old and they can handle a drum set, you know, and yeah. right. every right. bit of riff on it. Same with uh, pianists and um, just, you know, violinists. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah. it's amazing. Although uh, there are the savants of the mm. world, sure, yeah. and that is still part of a brain function. Although a lot of times it's not part of a normal brain function. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, all of us with normal brain functions are just going to have to learn our butts off. I yeah. think is yeah. is part of it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. We're you know I'm still learning about that. I'm still reading and researching that whole kind of endeavor. But for the most part, most of it um, are are training every day. Yeah. If you talk to Yo Yo Ma and you ask him what he works on, he works on scales. Mm. He doesn't work on the piece that he's playing. He doesn't play that piece necessarily right. over and over again, but he works on scales constantly right. so that when he's in trouble in a performance, he knows exactly where to go. Yeah. And it's the same uh, painting and drawing. If you are painting and drawing, if you're doing video art, then I'm sorry for you. Because but... <laughs> <laughs> at some point, you're going to take a picture of yourself naked and it's all over. <laughs> anyway. uh, but... but there's always that lighting and angle thing to brought in question, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very flattering angle you chose there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to mention, I took cinematography classes in, in art school, and I loved them, and I loved the animation. And 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 doing live action film and there was a student that walked into my class at one point uh, uh to turn in his finished film mm. his finished film was an empty projector and an in empty tape recorder with the reels 
on the tape recorder and the reels on the projector. He shined the projector at the empty reels going around on the tape recorder, and it bounced the reflection off and onto the wall. He pointed to the wall, and he said, that's my film. I thought, oh, man, he's in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> man, is he going to get it? Right. And the instructor went bananas yeah. about how brilliant it was and See, how it was the essence of film. That's whatever. You know what? That's kind of that 70s psychedelic mentality that was going on in film <laughs> schools and art schools back then where you can get away exactly. get with that kind of abstract thinking, and it's like, that's not a wall. It's a picture of a wall. That's not a hand. It's a picture of a hand. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, dude, come on. Yeah, it's it's intellectual inbreeding. Exactly. It's taking the same idea and working it so often and so hard that pretty much after a while it's numb. Mm-hmm. And I firmly believe the, the fine art arena is numb mm-hmm. today. However, there are such sparks of light. People mm-hmm. are still painting, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, still sculpting, yeah. still really doing some great stuff. Mm-hmm. And usually it's the people I find that, that just said, you know what, <laughs> I'm not trying to change the world of, of painting or the world of art, or rather the world of art. Um, I just want to paint or yeah. I just want to sculpt yeah. or express. And I've come to that. It's taken a long time to come to that for myself because I think that one of the bad things I picked up from the art school was that I was supposed to think of myself as an artist. Mm-hmm. Illustration was a bad word. Mm-hmm. You know, I did it for money. Mm-hmm. And uh, I realized later that every fine artist out there that's trying to use this as a living is doing it for money. Yeah, sure. Yeah, And uh, it eventually gets down to the money. Mm-hmm. So it took me a long time to be able to realize, oh, wait a minute, I'm a painter. I'm not really trying to change the face of art in the world. You know, I really think we've explored that enough. It's not really rocket science. Mm -hmm. we got some colors, you know, Roy G. Biv. We throw them together. We do our best job. I mean, after that, there's no subatomic particles we're working with. (laughs) It's pigment, you know. Right. (laughs) And, uh... You know, thinking about it in different ways, that's that's wonderful, and it's all about personal expression, I think. And yeah. uh, it took a long time to fight against all that and realize, oh, that's what it is. Okay. I, I guess Madame Curie and uh, Albert Einstein were not uh, worried about the painters and artists of their day, you know, as uh, no. com- competing in, in creative <laughs> right, endeavors. It's right. like, uh, no, I'm, no, I think I'll, I'll find the cure them. for polio. How about that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They weren't worried they were going to catch up with them or something. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, God. Now, you've made some pretty profound statements on some of the videos that, you, that you've had, like Above the Timberline. Yeah. Could you elaborate on what you said there as far as artists that are, are – artists shouldn't try to relate to the world? They're... Oh, oh yeah. You know, well, there's a couple things. I mean, one of the things I find myself telling the students a lot is to try not to be so original – because they really start looking for stuff that hasn't been done before. And if you're going to do that, you're going to look until you're a little old man Mm -hmm. uh, or a woman. Mm -hmm. And it's not about originality. It just isn't. Mm -hmm. What it is about is authenticity. It really is about being real Mm -hmm. about what you love. Mm -hmm. And when I I set students off on that path, the same one that I tried to take and, and still try to take, uh, they do way better because what's in them already is is far more authentic and realistic than if they tried to be something else to prove something to the world. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make sense to do that. And so um, I find or have found, I guess, in the 30-some-odd years, 32 or 33 years I've been doing this, that uh, it's it really turns out to be a waste of time to try to impress too much about how uh, clever we are. Mm-hmm. And um, it, when we, I mean, the way we think as artists already is different from the mainstream of folks out there. Mm-hmm. Right. And that goes back to probably five and six years old, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, those kids that are they're sort of starting to wake up to their skills, like you said, maybe the savants, you know. Mm-hmm. But... Um, yeah, it's it's different uh, living in the world as an artist 
as opposed to living in the world as a person. I tend to go back and forth, I guess. I think I was trying to make that point in, in the, the download, mm-hmm. that um, that it is that particular different point of view that we can use to communicate from to other people that either don't have that particular point of view or don't spend time uh, looking at things in a different way. Mm-hmm. And and we can look at things in a different way and sort of present it back to a person who isn't used to doing that. And they're surprised and delighted by it. And that feeds us to go back into that, to our little world and look for some more and come back out and express it again. So it's this wonderful kind of loop mm-hmm. to me of expressing and getting results and getting a reaction and getting an understanding and then going back in and getting some more and coming back out and then feeding it. You know, I, I love that process. And again, when I paint, I assume that the person that's going to look at my work is intelligent. I just make that assumption right away. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean that in a cocky way. I mean that in a way that says, if you're drawn to my stuff or if you're looking at it, then you're curious. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to assume if you're curious that you're intelligent. Mm-hmm. And I don't have to beat you over the head with some lame brain concept. Mm-hmm. What I want to touch is your guts mm-hmm. right away. I want you to look at my work and feel it in your gut and, and then let it get to your head. Um, because after that, I got gotcha. you. Mm-hmm. Because you will not stop looking at the painting. And, and the way I can do that uh, in my mind is that if I do it myself when I'm painting, then I know it has to do it uh, to the folks that are drawn to what I do. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like those eyes that follow you around the room in a portrait. Yeah. Everybody, yeah. <laughs> everybody thinks it's so magic, you know. No, all you got to do is make the eyes look at you, the painter, and it's always going to look at everybody, <laughs> no matter what angle. <laughs> I was I was at the Rockefeller Center not long ago. I don't know if you've been there and looked up in the lobby, but um, a guy named Jose Serk painted the ceilings mm-hmm. and and all these fantastic forms. If you've never seen it, you've really got to get yeah, there and take I've a look. Mm-hmm. It's it's wonderful, mm-hmm. and it has this optical illusion. He's got these giants straddling two pillars that are in the lobby. Mm-hmm. Well, if you go to one side of the lobby, it looks like the weight on his one leg has shifted to, say, the right. And as you walk to the other side of the lobby, it looks like his weight is shifting to his other leg. Okay. <laughs> it's bizarre how that works. <laughs> wow. And everybody's all mystified by it. But if you go and stand in the middle, then he's perfectly balanced on both legs. Well, that's the key. <laughs> it's just like the <laughs> eyes in the painting of a portrait. Okay. You put them in the center, and it's an optical illusion. Mm, okay. It's not magic. And to me, again, I smiled because uh, it was a process of learning that mm. it wasn't a gift. Mm. So um, I, I just, I really think that's important. Just, uh, I agree. Uh, as a circular thing. But, yeah, to answer your question, the, um, uh, the, the thing I'm trying to, to grab for is, is the viewer's gut mm. with all of it. And it only took, you know, 30-some-odd years to figure that one out. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 Greg, I mean, you talk about like wanting to be gut level and there are other painters in history that to me have always had that kind of a direct impact, uh, impact yeah, on right. me as, as a viewer and as somebody who, who loves art. Did, mm-hmm. Are you taken aback when you get compared to guys like an N.C. Wyeth or a Howard Pyle <laughs> who, well, I mean, I, and, and, and to me, that's that's you're in their company, especially Seriously. especially oh. with, with as long as a career as you've had. I mean, oh, you, you, you're still very much at your peak right and now. And it's not even about the length of career. Well, it's yeah. about the credibility of your work. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, thanks. Jeez, Seriously. You guys, I'm, I'm shuffling my feet, kicking dirt here. Uh, <laughs> I, that, that's, I really appreciate that. I used to worry that, and I laughed when you said N.C. Wyeth, because a lot of people will just point right to N.C. right away. Um, certainly have been influenced by N.C. in about six thousand other yeah. artists I can't anybody who's put a really cool line on a piece of paper, I'm yeah. I'm there, you know. But I used to worry about being compared to anybody else because I thought that was the kiss 
kiss of death for an artist okay. because they kept pushing that you have to be original, you have to be original, you have to be original. Well, I'm already original. So are you guys. Mm-hmm. So is everybody listening to this. Uh, but what's difficult at times is to really get authentic about it mm-hmm. and get true to that. Mm-hmm. And what I loved was that painterly approach. Mm-hmm. And I, I had loved that all my life. And early on had loved it, but got caught up in, in these techniques um, when I was an early illustrator. I thought I had to be clever and tricky and mix things together. And I had a ton of other techniques going on. Mm. I mixed all kinds of media together. I did a pencil drawing style that sold very well. Mm. Uh, I did a colored pencil style. I did watercolors and pastels and oils, and I mixed them all together. And it was, you know, I had work from uh, pretty big agencies in Chicago and mm. around the country for doing all kinds of advertising things. Time Magazine, Newsweek. It, it reads oh, like no, a list. Those, oh, those came later. Okay. You see. In the beginning, when I was doing all the other stuff, nobody remembered what it was I was doing. Mm. As a matter of fact, I came to New York and I was trying to get an agent. Mm. And uh, one of the guys flipped through my portfolio like a phone book. And uh, he said, what do you like to do? I said, well, I kind of like that oil painting style that just flew by. And that, oh, that colored pencil style, I kind of like that. And he said, well, you know, I'd, I'd pick one or two at the most of these. And he closed the lid on it and shoved it across the desk to me. And he said, look me in the face and said, because I've forgotten what you do already. Wow. Hmm. And that was like, you know, arrows in the chest. And I tried to maintain my composure, which I did, and I smiled. And then his partner came in and gave me the same story. Mm. And I went home on the plane pretty pissed off at those guys. What was his point, the, Greg? Well, I, in, I understood his, pa- his point when my plane landed back home. I finally realized I was angry at me. Mm. What those guys were telling me was, you can do so much, but you're doing nothing because you're not focused. And when I went home, I knew exactly what I had to do from just that guy's comment. Mm-hmm. And I, I talk to him every now and then today and, you know, and laugh about it because he really helped me. Mm-hmm. He helped me focus. And what I needed was to understand that inside me, way down inside, was an oil painter. And I loved it 100%. Okay. And I went home and I called my reps at the time and I said, you know, I'm going to do oil painting, a painterly style. And they said, that's a death knell for your career. Because everybody was doing tight rendered stuff back in the 80s. Mm, and I right. said, I don't care if I don't do this. I'm going to go be a pilot or something. Mm. And so uh, I, I spent the next year painting my brains out. I also spent that same year keeping up with what I'd been doing so I could survive. I had a family at the time. Mm-hmm. and uh, But I kept painting. And I made it as painterly as possible. Mm. And I trained and trained and I, I built up a portfolio and then I started getting it out there. Mm. And uh, one of the places that really went for my early oil painting stuff was Omni Magazine. Mm, okay. And uh, that was that was fun. It's gorgeous stuff. Uh, oh, thanks, yeah. thanks. But uh, it it sort of once the magazine went belly up, and I didn't know how the genre worked. All that work dried up, and nobody remembered that I did science fiction stuff either. Mm. Mm. But these magazines that you mentioned, Newsweek and Time and, and all the other stuff, uh, that didn't come until I did the oil painting work. Mm-hmm. And I didn't care uh, what it looked like as long as it was me in those brush strokes. Mm-hmm. As long as I was, I was putting them down the way I wanted them. And when I did that, I was a lot happier. And then the phone started to ring, and that was even more happiness. So it, it kind of went from there. Uh so, I, actually, I, I credit one of my big influences as a fine artist from Cincinnati area. That's where I grew up, mm-hmm. in northern Kentucky. His name was Frank Duvenek, and I saw a show of his at the Cincinnati Art Museum when I was 19. and went, oh, my God, mm-hmm. this guy puts down paint like nobody else. And um, brilliant stuff. Most of his, his uh, test paintings are his, his color uh, trials, you know, are are absolutely stunningly gorgeous because he was just throwing down paint without really thinking about it. It was mm-hmm. gorgeous. Mm-hmm. It was all training, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, so so I shied away from the 
that kind of correlation with the golden age illustrators. And then I thought, nah, I'm going to embrace that. Mm. So I just kept going. <laughs> Gary Kelly will look at me every now and then we're out having dinner or something when we're all in town for Richard's meetings, Richard Solomon's meetings. Right. He'll say, how is it that you're still working? <laughs> 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 you know, it's just, it doesn't seem like I look around and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of the the painterly guys left. But you know, there's a lot of people doing oil paint still. Mm-hmm. So you know, I'm in with good company, and I don't know. I keep my head down and I just keep working. Mm-hmm. You know. So in in your embracing of the the oil painter within, mm-hmm. uh, so to speak, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> is it your opinion basically that? there was more truth that was coming through the work and that's why you yeah. became less forgettable in the, I guess, in the mind of the, uh, the, the AD guy yeah, that you, yeah. that you were showing your portfolio to dead nuts on. Absolutely. Okay. That's it. Okay. Uh, because I was being way more authentic to my first love and, and I was being far more honest when I put that paint down, mm. uh, because before, you know, uh, I was doing all these different styles. I got kind of confused. I really thought, oh, well, you know, illustration is a mixture of, like, conceptual stuff and good painting and storytelling and all this other, uh, all these other directions mm-hmm. that I was really getting confused, and I wanted to try it all. Uh, mm-hmm. I love that. I love the idea of being an artist that can sculpt and paint and do photography, and I'm trying now as best I can, um, a little at a time, to learn digital. Mm-hmm. Because I, I love that, too. It looks so great. But um, it's only really been over the past decade that I really realized what I wanted to do. Okay. And really only the last handful of years that I feel like only just now am I doing the kind of paintings that I really had set out to do and have the skills built up to accomplish them. Really? This, this is... Yeah, I, I'm very honest about that. I mean, past the awards and the medals and things like that, only recently are these pieces the ones that really uh, I feel like I'm I'm getting to what I was looking for. Wow. So I, I'm I'm excited about where I can go now. Um, and I look back with, into my past anyway with a smile mm-hmm. at having having been able to struggle through all that stuff and kept going. You know, this was keeping you fresh, you know. That's what that's what we see when you when you when you lay down your paints. Oh, great! I'm glad that's coming across. Thanks, because because uh, it is excitement. I mean, every time the paint goes down the way I want it or the way I see it in my head, and I'm, I'm as a sidebar. Sorry about the pun to that. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm uh, actually opening up a little bit more to um, different stroking and colors and shifting of the paint but when it goes down the way i want it in my head it's an absolute thrill and and i can take that energy and add it into um another piece i i don't get tired when i paint i get energized and while i'm doing one painting i'm coming up with ideas for five more wow and uh (laughs) The only thing I got my fingers crossed for is that my heart holds out and I've got my faculties until I'm <laughs> right. 120. You know? Right. So, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I'm very excited about where that can go. Mm. And right at the point where I'm um, wanting to do more and more gallery work, um, I actually am working on the story for Above the Timberline. Okay. Uh, that's coming up. I'm, I, uh, I have a publisher that's very interested in doing a an elaborately illustrated book, kind of on the lines of like the illustrated books in the Dinotopia line. That oh, much illustration. Nice. Uh, I kind of sold them on the idea, and uh, so I'm working that out. And that's going to be a lot of work, but that's going to be I'm awesome. Looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we are too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'll keep you guys posted. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sort of hoping to to do something where I can. You know, sort of track the progress online or something. Okay. Okay. It's amazing today, the internet and all that. I mean, you know, you guys remember when that stuff wasn't around. Sure. Oof, the business was even harder than that. And I'll tell you what's incredible is (laughs) is to be of the age that that record that we're we're all in that you're able to still penetrate that stuff and get involved in it and the and like the Ninja Mountains and things of that nature. 
um, and and really different communities and stuff, and still 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 be active in that community. Some guys that are you know of of you know the quintessential age are are, are not interested in being involved in that fully the way that you are, and you can be congratulated for that. Well, thanks. I mean, that's true. I have some friends who are pretty hard hardcore luddites when it comes to that. You know, they, they just, <laughs> I mean, they are swearing they are never going to touch the computer, and I, I kind of shake my head. I, I see it as, as really fun stuff. Um, but it could be that it goes back to, like you guys said before, um, never growing up, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I hope, I know I will um, grow up at some point, but I hope it's a long time from now. And I also consider myself enough um, old enough to be mature enough to know when I can get away with having fun and, and let the silliness come into the work. Right. Um, why else would I paint a guy going up a mountainside with sentient polar bears? <laughs> 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 Doesn't make sense, you know. But that yes. that that image above the timberline it's is incredible. Yeah, that 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 kicked my <laughs> ass, sir. I mean, it really did. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, man. Well, I'm yeah. glad I could kick your ass without the martial arts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, it was it was just, yeah. it was breathtaking. And it's, you know. Thanks. You know, I, you know, Dwight and I talked about, you know, talked about your art before we, you know, once we realized that we were going to get a chance to speak with you. Right, and, right. I mean, yeah. and, and, and the way you're able to capture certain moments and moods, yeah, moments and, moods and periods. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 mm. and movement within you transcends know, the page, sir. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> it really does. Well, I yeah. mean, we just all oh, we, we were really floored by that one, and um, and some of the stuff on 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 your site and other things that we found here and there, and it's just yeah. I don't know. I, I guess it was just a gush moment, but yeah. Well, yeah. I I I tell you what, it, <clears throat> all of that did not come out of talent. Mm-hmm. Um, all of that came out of a lot of doggone hours behind the board and mm-hmm. observing and reading and looking at other paintings. Mm-hmm. And um, I I take real personal pride in that because it were it was a work ethic that mm-hmm. that got to that point. And I am mm-hmm. still working my ass off to get that right. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you mentioned movement in a painting. I mean, even when somebody is standing still, I'm trying to give it some kind of internal spinning. So that it feels like they're about to move or something like that. Mm. And that takes a lot of training, I think. Um, still working on uh, battle scenes and com- composing figures that move and cross over one another and, and trying to make advances that way. Um, uh, every time I work on something for National Geographic, I'm trying to bring an as- aspect of excitement about history to it mm-hmm. that can have some movement to it because, you know, humans have been moving for thousands of years and just showing these static paintings under a uh, studio lamp is sort of... Yes. <laughs> you know, I want to get something going on in the painting that brings you back and wants you to search and research and, and maybe even do your own reading because you saw something I painted or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and, and to really just kind of share in the excitement of, of something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to teach a, a, an entire class on, on movement within the frame. I think that would be fun. Mm-hmm. You know? But I, you know, I'm losing my, my heroes, some of my favorite illustrators. Um, I just made contact with John Berkey when unfortunately he passed away. Oh, and okay. John Berkey is awesome. like that. Yeah, John Berkey yeah. is the bomb. Oh, these guys. <laughs> amazing, amazing. And uh, so uh, I, I still study uh, the guys from the 60s and 70s at length because they could compose like nobody's business. Those guys were brilliant. Yeah. Just brilliant at yeah. it. And uh, I love that stuff. And so it it never stops, I don't think. Um, learning. Greg, Greg uh, as far as, because uh, one of the things I noticed on your site, too, is, is you have uh, quite a few portraits there. Mm-hmm. And I wanted, mm-hmm. to, I wanted to ask you that, um, like, when I was younger, uh, an older artist told me that one of the fastest ways to learn how to get likenesses down was to try caricaturing. He said that, you know, 
the exaggerations that you would employ mm. in caricatures would be one way to kind of help you really be able to see a person's face for all the quirks and, and individual particulars. Spot planes and, and lights. Yeah. And, yeah. How, how did you get so good at, at, at capturing likenesses? Well, I, I would agree with that instructor 100%. I, I didn't think I'd say 100%, but the more I think about it, I think that's absolutely right on because I had an experience when I was in art school in a figure drawing class. Mm-hmm. And at one point, I just thought, you know, I've been drawing this Diagon model the same way for too long now. And I loved uh, cartoons, and I loved comic books, and I, I love uh, the graphic art like that mm-hmm. that exaggerates. I loved um, the cartoonists that exaggerated. And I thought, yeah, what if I just distorted this figure all the hell? Um, and I still have that drawing somewhere, and I... I started drawing it, and oh my God, it was easier to draw it that way. Mm -hmm. I wasn't limited, and I captured more of that mood right away than ever before, and I I really took that home as a lesson. Mm. And so um, exaggeration is a great way to learn, and and of course, you know, to have a career. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Peter DeSev and and Philip Burke and those guys. But uh, it, it taught me a lot about what what's real about uh, a, a face, and uh, it's all about the, the structure, of course, and the planes and all that, and I learned a lot more by exaggeration. Uh, but one of the things, I guess, for wanting to do and having done now um, throughout these years a lot of portraits is that I always thought that that was a key signature of someone who was good Mm. and i just sort of thought i'd better try to be good at it Mm. and the more i tried to be good at the more i started to love it Mm. uh and i always found joy in trying to capture someone's likeness so it's only now that i'm starting to loose up loosen up enough to capture someone's uh kind of now this sounds a little zen but uh, to sort of capture their their spiritedness, you know, mm-hmm. that sort of says something about them without actually capturing all the details. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, that's a skill to learn as well, and mm-hmm. maybe that will stretch into some different types of portraitures and in the in the future for me, I don't know. Mm. I think uh, some of the most brilliant portrait painters around are the, the kinds of artists where they can paint a portrait and you can see it, you may not know who the person is, right. but you know it's a real person. Right. You, you know, this wasn't something that they just came up with out of their head. You know, mm-hmm. you see the body right. language. Mm-hmm. You see the particulars of the face mm-hmm. or a certain character yeah. in it, and you know this is a real person, even though you may have never met this person mm-hmm. or ever heard their name before. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Like Andrew yeah. Wyeth's uh, famous lady, he always drew her, and, you, you know, you th- we know, we know she's a real person, but we, we, she had to be real because she looked so like, yeah. authentic. <laughs> yeah, you know? back to that word again. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, there's there's also the thing about nature being so authentic <laughs> and uh-huh. being so real. <laughs> you know, a lot of people will say, um, oh, gee, did you paint that out of your head, or did you, did you paint it from photography? Mm-hmm. And Nowadays, I tell them I, I did it from both. Right. You see, I got the idea from my head because I have a lot of ideas. And when I work on a piece, then I go and I, get, I do the research and I get the reality that I'm going to look at to bring my idea more to fruition so that when you look at it as a viewer, you feel uh, the guts and the realism, if, it, if that's what's necessary, or you get that kind of feeling I'm trying to get across. And by mm-hmm. looking at nature and real things and, and using photo reference, mm-hmm. I can find those elements um, that are random that I hadn't expected that nature throws out constantly. Mm-hmm. And so you know when an artist is, is working from life or from uh, really researching a lot that uh, they've been observing because if you're pulling it out of your head all the time, uh, I think anyway, and especially for my work, you tend to um, revisit the same areas all the time mm-hmm. and the same ideas and the same aspects of anatomy and lighting and mm-hmm. composition. And so by looking and observing, I can jog that and mm-hmm. try to find more 
which excites me about more ideas, and it becomes, again, circular. Mm -hmm. I think we all want our pieces to grow. I I think some artists um, actually just want to get to a point where they've simplified it in their mind, where they're going to have a career where if I just get to such and such a date and I got all this down and everybody loves this, then I'm just going to do that the rest of my life and have a nice life. Mm -hmm. And some guys do that. Mm -hmm. Some people do that. And I don't want to do that. And I dare say the majority of folks want to keep exploring. Mm -hmm. But it is tricky because we can get caught in a a circle again of of, um, painting things that sell and painting things that people love. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just like, you know, musicians and actors and writers. Yeah. The creative arts, I think, are basically all that mm-hmm. that way. The endeavor, the principles of the endeavor don't really change. Mm-hmm. It's how you apply them. But I hope that answered your question. It did. Yeah. Oh, dead it air did. time. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. No. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Greg, how, how have the changes in, in the business over these many years uh, challenged you if they have at all? Because, I mean, you mentioned earlier about, you know, you started mm-hmm. one way and then you really started, you know, refocusing, refocusing yourself on the uh, on the, the oil painting. Right. But, I mean, you know, styles change and they, they come in favor with, you know, with art directors and people who give out jobs and then they go another way. And, um, and yeah. you, you even implied earlier, I guess, through uh, Gary Kelly's comments that there's kind of a disappearance of, of painting and, and really right. illustration in, in magazines and advertising and stuff. Same yeah, there's a real loss of, uh, of storytelling um, through the type of work that I do anyway. Uh-huh. Um, and I tend to think that I'm still working because, I'm, you know, uh, A, I'm pissed off and determined to keep at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so B, I'm one of the only guys they can call. Uh, I don't know. But, uh, you know, over the years, uh, there's been a real arc of, how things have been going in the business. Um, but I, that's only just because of my lifetime observation. I'm sure that that there have been, you know, many in the history of illustration in America, how things have gone. You, you know how it goes. Somebody gets hot, things get hip, mm-hmm. and right. uh, they buy it up, buy it up, buy it up, and people get tired of it, and mm-hmm. they move to something else. And, you know, it, it keeps going that way. And I think for me, with, with the painting the way I do, I have been able to take the uh, approach that I have Mm -hmm. and apply it to different themes Mm -hmm. and different aspects that way. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can do a painting for the uh, Abraham Lincoln Memorial Museum, a portrait of uh, Lincoln, (laughs) and then, (laughs) sorry, that wasn't my ding on purpose, that was my email (laughs) coming in. Is that the dinner bell? (laughs) (laughs) Come hither, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Ding, time to eat. Uh, but uh, or I can I can do a painting for a book cover, or I can do uh, a painting that works for um, National Geographic uh, storytelling history, or storytelling uh, on a museum wall, or I can do uh, Richard's art on a grand scale stuff, where mm-hmm. it's maybe a landscape, mm-hmm. or maybe it's a painting of somebody's building. Um, I've always tried to be strong in the figure and, of course, portraiture, Mm -hmm. because those two things never go away. Mm -hmm. Any students that are listening will will definitely want to know that. They just won't go away. Mm -hmm. Painting the human being is um, probably the key element in anybody's portfolio, Mm -hmm. because after that, you can paint anything, you know, Mm -hmm. horses, animals, cars. And I think that's part of... uh, Watching how things got uh, got away from that looseness that was in the in the early to middle '70s, mm-hmm. and started tightening up toward the end of the '70s, and we got into the '80s, and oh my God, if you didn't if you didn't paint photo realistically, you weren't working. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, I I got caught up in that because I thought, well, I I want to work, I have skills, and uh, I developed uh, painting and rendering highly detailed work especially for clients and uh, I also had my sloppy side that was my the the side of me that kept my rendering side sane uh, <laughs> I like that, I like that. <laughs> well you know the rendering 
uh, when you're painting tight like that, um, the hardest part is working on the loose areas. If, and I did a combination in some of the work where areas were loose and sloppy, and then I'd tighten up for a focus mm -hmm. in, in the person or where I could control where you were looking at that painting. Mm -hmm. uh, and those were the easiest areas. The focus was easy because all I knew to do and all I had to do was just tighten my butt up on, in, in all those areas. And it was a very simple way to think. But in the loose areas, it, it had me really having to work in a way that allowed me to be open and creative and all the rest at the same time. So that was more work. Mm. Um, and so likewise, when I was going through the 80s and things were so tight, um, I started to develop a real irritation for that. <laughs> even when I saw still new people coming into the field, they're even tighter than the last people coming into the field. <laughs> that really pissed me off. <laughs> so uh, I, I just, you know, really realized when that portfolio was shoved across the desk that it was time for me to oil paint, mm. and it had to be loose. Mm. And uh, it, it was such a career moment. Uh, but, you know, nobody, there's no goal line. There's no point at which somebody says to you, you know, you're a professional now, and you go to this great ceremony, and they put a hat on you. And <laughs> sure you do. You get a, the professional award, you know. You get accepted by Society of Illustrators like you did. You get, your, you get, you get inside the book of Society of Illustrators, and you, you become, you're the man now. Yeah, you're a professional. Yeah. Man. <laughs> I got to tell you, I'll be honest with you and everybody that, uh, you know, I'm up there getting the Hamilton King Award, which you'd think was pretty much the heights of your career, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm telling everybody, well, you ain't seen nothing yet, because inside <laughs> I'm thinking, holy cow, you imposter. <laughs> what are you going to do now? Uh, but uh, I think a lot of people feel that way. I've talked to a lot of the guys, and, and I, I understood that from from uh, from the martial arts, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, they they put a black belt on you and you're suddenly the killer. I don't think so. Right. Yeah. What, no, what you... Really, all it means is you are so screwed. Because <laughs> now <laughs> anybody finds out you got a black belt, they're just going to kick your butt off. That's true. <laughs> You're a marked man now. now the expectations yeah. have been elevated. You yeah. know? The black belt is like a bullseye. It's true. <laughs> Well, and and try getting a black belt in ninjutsu, and then they think you're supposed to be invisible. So, okay. You know. All right. Okay. <laughs> right. That's true. Now, now you've now you've you've remarked on that before. You kind of like alluded to that before in certain conversations. Uh, do you have a martial arts mm -hmm. background? Uh, <laughs> my martial arts started when I was 28. Okay. So you, I was an old man already okay. at 28, okay. starting out in the martial arts. I don't know if you, you guys. It sounds like some of you, one of you guys has done martial arts, but you know, martial arts you do when you're 15, and by the time you're 21, you're looking to retire, because uh, right. you're either crippled, right. broken, or you've won enough medals to to go into film. Or, or <laughs> right, exactly. I like Chuck Norris. Right? Uh, or, you're yeah. old, or you're old enough to get embarrassed like Chuck Liddell did get, a little while ago and got shut down in front of a bunch of a million oh, people yeah, on yeah, television. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Uh, Ultimate Fighter? Yeah. yeah. Ice oh, movie. really? Yeah, it was Chuck pretty Liddell, pretty embarrassing yeah. for him. I feel sorry for him. But, oh, man. You know, you have to oh. know when to hold him, know when to fold him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, oh, my God, especially in the martial arts. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> um, but, uh but, yeah, I got started late, and, of course, I, I thought, oh, I'm in this for, you know, I'm going to learn. I'm just learning because I want to learn how to take care of myself, you know. And then I started to get caught up in tournament stuff. I never did do a tournament because I either got a cold <laughs> or I broke a rib or something like that. Right. So I never had to do that. And then I, I started reading uh, Stephen Hayes' books about ninjutsu, and um, I thought, oh, my God, i got to find out where this guy lives. And something in my head said, this guy lives near where I grew up. I didn't know why. Mm. And it turns out he was 45 minutes down the road from wow. where I grew up. So I moved there and started training with him, became a personal student, and uh, ate it up. Uh, went to Japan and learned a whole ton of stuff, obviously about martial arts, but not so obviously about my work. Mm. And I found that uh, the two endeavors were so similar. Mm that it really opened my head okay. to uh, 
to all kinds of stuff that was possible in painting. And uh, so I kind of credit the martial arts for helping to wake me up, too. Hmm, that's that's pretty it, cool. it might have been one of my friend's heels piercing my ribs <laughs> one time. But... <laughs> God. So, the, so the yin and yang still exists inside of the artwork as well as the, uh, as well as the martial arts. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. You know, I, f I find myself talking to students in a kind of a Zen-like way, and I kind of kid with them, you know, mm -hmm. that, that a lot of the stuff about painting and drawing does not make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and you just have to trust that if you put the time into it and the effort and the love, you'll come out the other side with a whole bunch better person mm -hmm. uh, doing the artwork. And it's all about skill at that point. Mm -hmm. And the skill leads to better thinking. You know, I'm I'm really at odds with a lot of the art schools. I I should be wearing a T-shirt that says "Draw now, think about it later." No, ah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's that's a cool one. <laughs> well, you know, it, it it's about getting going. Mm -hmm. And if there's too much thinking, and this happens on on a painting by painting basis too, if you think too much, you hesitate. If you hesitate. You procrastinate, and if you procrastinate long enough, you're uh, you're into paralysis at that point. That's you're just true. not going to do it. That's true. And I have a lot of jobs that can start that way, and I have to retrain myself to go, okay, just start the thumbnails. Mm -hmm. Just start the process, because mm -hmm. once the thumbnails start to go, it all cascades from there. Mm -hmm. One thing and, leads to another. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, and and I start thinking clearly. And I start simplifying and understanding. And so the thinking comes out of the drawing, not the other way around. Uh, but, you know, you, there are those cases where somebody talks to you and so all of a sudden, boink, there's an idea that comes to mind. Right. And um, I was talking to my girlfriend before the above the Timberline thing came up. And I said, you know, uh, they're going to be here in about two days and I have no clue what I'm going to do. <laughs> 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 She said, uh, well, you like to paint snow. Why don't you paint a guy riding a polar bear or something like that? <laughs> so, yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, when I hung up the phone, I'd taken some notes and stuff. And I didn't have a guy riding a polar bear, but polar bears came to mind and it just yeah. snapped, right? right yeah. I just saw it right there. And they're sentient, no less. Right. <laughs> Sent right. Sentient polar bears. And, right. and they don't talk. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not here or there. Right? Yeah. Uh, as soon as I make them talk, oh, that's it. I'm toast. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so. uh, when you when you work on a piece like Above the Timberline, Greg, or, mm -hmm. and obviously you said thumbnails, and you know, and, and you got a little bit of inspiration from from your from your lady. Like, do you at some point stop and get the reference for what the the guy's wearing or for any of that stuff? Or, like, you know, how involved is that part in, in your finishing a piece or, you know, seeing it through? We know he gets well, reference. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but I, what I'm just wondering, you know, is, is does does some of it, like, does 80% of it come and you just need to go get the other 20% as actual reference? Or, okay. you know, how does that? How does well, it? you know, as far as the process goes, um, it's uh, especially on that one above the, the above the timberline. I had a very open line thumbnail, mm -hmm. and I nailed it on the first thumbnail. It, but that was because it was pretty simple looking. I had a shape, a lump for a guy, five lumps for polar bears, a couple of mountain <laughs> lines, and I, I went okay. And I saw my diagonal line cutting through there, and I said that's it. And so I went to my closet and started pulling out clothes and. Uh, and built this sort of steampunkish, roguish costume of a guy. I even threw a sword in there, and I, <laughs> uh, I posed for that and shot some stuff, and then looked for a mountain reference, and I sort of cobbled it all together. I took uh, shots of me, and then um, I, I redrew it all together, all different shots into one main figure, and pieced it together from there, and. Um, Looked at tons of reference of mountains and mm -hmm. looked at sections of mountains and parts and I made up uh, made up the polar bears just by looking at photographs of polar bears because I I didn't have any from that angle so I had to redraw them mm -hmm. and I had to redraw the slope and all that sort of thing and made up a staff so so you know it's a real mixture it it, 
it does come from working on the thumbnail and designing. And once I have that down, then the rest kind of cascades okay. after that. Okay. And I, I'll go shoot reference. I shoot myself a lot because I've found in the uh, recent years that instead of trying to get the model to act the way I want, I can find that I can act it out. Mm, right. And then I'll trade sense. the heads out and stuff. And, and sometimes I just paint me anyway. Mm, okay. <laughs> some, people, <laughs> some people can tell, other people can't. And, right. um, you know, sometimes it matters uh, to me and I sort of cringe and other times I don't care. And, mm -hmm. uh, but um, a lot of times to really get to your and answer your question really quickly, it depends on the deadline. <laughs> right, right. Is, you know, when you, when you got a camera crew looming, uh, you know, coming in in 48 hours, uh, there's no time to look up, uh, you know, friends <laughs> or professional models or whatever. Right. Uh, in National Geographic, I, I did a bunch of um, pirates for them a couple yeah. years ago. Yeah, we saw them. Very um, nice. Yeah, oh, you got a chance to see those? Mm -hmm. they, those were... <laughs> Those were done about 30 by 40 inches, but they were blown up to about 8 foot by 12 foot. One was 8 by 16 foot. It was supposed to be 8 Jeez. by 20. Okay. But, uh, you know, digitally enlarged, and uh, they gave me, uh, they got to me with 12 weeks um, before the deadline. Mm. And, uh, of course, four weeks of that was chewed up trying to get done the rest of my work. So no. I did... Um, 10 murals in eight weeks. Wow. And that was... Oh, those murals uh, are awesome, too. I've yeah. seen them. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you thanks. It, I, I got to say, it was it was 30 years effort came to the fore. Right, uh, right. On all those. Um, a, it was pirates, man. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Can I turn that down? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. B, I didn't have any time. Yeah, right. And C, they had fairly good money but not the best mm -hmm. um but i wasn't going to turn that down in the least and yeah, so yeah. <laughs> i had to perform and i pulled on uh 30 years of being able to look back at some pretty narrow passages some pretty uh scary points where i was just about to make it and all that sort of thing mm -hmm. um as far as uh deadlines were concerned mm -hmm. and uh I was able to pull it out of the hat, and I remember the evening of the opening of the show, I was sitting on the floor in the main gallery of the pirate show, one o'clock in the morning, with a margarita in my hand, <laughs> okay. leaning up, you know, sitting against the wall in a pirate suit, <laughs> and looking at <laughs> Yo -ho -ho. By myself, <laughs> by myself, while the music swept over me from the gallery, you know, some kind of pirate music, and I realized, holy crap, I made the deadline. <laughs> That's <laughs> <Okay>. cool. That's <laughs> cool. <laughs> it wasn't until that moment that I realized I, I actually made it, but it, it really did. Uh, it really took thirty years to be able to do that mm -hmm. because um, it. I needed to paint. In every one of those paintings, there's probably 18 to 35 figures. Mm -hmm. yeah. There were slaves and pirates and yeah. slavers and privateers and landscapes and ships and all that stuff. And I, I just had to start drawing my butt off. Mm -hmm. And I showed them uh, thumbnails first, and, and they, they said, okay, but they were stalling. So on the first painting, the first pirate painting, I decided, you know, if this job goes away if I fail I'm going to do the coolest one first so I did the battle scene right. and I did it without them giving me a um an okay to do it cool and uh I had to meet with the art director at an airport um to go and look at uh some uh maquette heads that were mm. made out of silicon mm. that was they were going to use in the actual exhibit and I met him, and I unraveled it in an upstairs hallway at the airport so that he could take a look at it. And I was worried, because at that point, he was going to say yay or nay on the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I unrolled it, and uh, he he just loved it. So When you did the microvisions thing, now, correct me if I'm wrong, those were very small pieces, right? Oh, yeah, those are five by seven. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Now, how was it more difficult, less difficult? Uh, did you enjoy working on that size format, or 
Oh, you know, actually, the microvisions format is really fun mm -hmm. because, uh, A, you can't get too involved. Mm -hmm. B, you want to make it look like it's really involved. <laughs> and C, <laughs> it's done really fast. <laughs> okay, okay. So okay. all those things are going for it. And what, what it forces at least me to do for what I for my approach is that it forces me to simplify okay. very strongly. It forces me to lay it down once and shut the hell up. Okay. And it it forces me to think of something that'll grab you in a very small way that feels kind of big. Right. And it's kind of tricky. Um, but it's, it's a fun challenge because, um, also science fiction, and I just love that stuff. Yeah, exactly. yeah, you know, up, you know. Rocket Man. I, you know, could hear no, the Elton right. John song exactly. playing in the background. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's one of three that I painted. I, I, I did uh, two others okay. because I couldn't decide which one I, I really liked. Right. So I have to show you guys the other two. Please do. Point, yeah, you know? yeah. We could post it but, on our blog. Uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> oh, hey, yeah, there we go. Yeah, that'd be great. And. Uh, you know, they, they took about two and a half hours each, and it's okay. it's all moon stuff, like um, the guy floating above the moon there, or at least a cratered gray planet, I guess, you know. But uh, there was a long time that I, I walked away from science fiction work. I had a huge file okay. of sketches and things I wanted to do, but I walked away from all of it because Omni was the only magazine I wanted to show my work in, because okay. it was this... It was this very classy, started out as this very classy coffee table magazine, mm -hmm. as you may remember. Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Science fiction, science fact, uh, really great articles, great stories. And nice it looked, illustrations. It made, yeah. yeah, yeah, it made science fiction look, you know, sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I've been waiting since I was a kid for that. And right. there's Omni, and I just yeah. thought that was great. And it also said to me, well, now I can paint and really get some strange thinking going on and have a good time. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I'm not in the business. I'm, I'm not really thought of as a strange conceptual thinker. Mm. Um, I, uh, a lot of times, by the time they get to using me, they've, they've already got a concept that they want. They already see it themselves in paint. I think, and that's why I get the work that I do, because I go, well, we, we, let's get Manchester to do this, because we already see it, and he'll be able to paint it, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Okay. And, uh, I, uh, you know, in the times where I've tried to push the concept a little farther, um, uh, the rare art director lets me do that. And it's not something where you're pushing it beyond belief, but uh, right. uh, it's sort of like, you know, a long time ago, the the Beatles used to try to stay one step ahead of their audience. You know, they didn't go from "Love Me Do" to um, "A Day in the Life" you know, or "A Day in the like Life" that. or yeah. "I'm Me Mine" or you know, uh, some of their singular work or whatever. You know, or especially um, uh, the last song that they ever recorded that's on the album, you know, "Abbey Road," the end. Right. Which mm -hmm. I find eh, ironic, but uh, yeah. no, they they always were one step ahead. Just pulling everybody upward toward where they wanted to go. Right. And I try to get that across to myself. Uh, I listen to my friends talk about it, and I especially talk about that with the students. Mm -hmm. uh, students are always trying to leap too far, and so their stuff gets a little bit more complex. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, you don't care. Mm -hmm. I try to pull them back, you know. Mm -hmm. One step ahead of yourself, that's where you're trying to push toward. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, way out there. But you know, you you look at that every now and then, but you keep your eye on what's what's in front of you. Yeah, with the internet being so accessible, you see all the great artists doing what you want to do. It's like, well, I know how to do this. Well, it takes time to get to that level and pace yourself accordingly, so you can won't be won't be disappointed and, and can move along. You know, a nice creative pace. Yeah, and I I wish I had the quote for you, but it was Bruce Lee and. Um, Enter the Dragon that was talking about keeping your eye on the moon, you know, mm -hmm. and paying attention to what's right in front of you, but not missing all that wonderful glory mm -hmm. that he said. <laughs> that sounds like <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> wonderful glory. <laughs> yeah, <that's right>. <laughs> <laughs> he was awesome. And, yeah, he was, and, and as funny as that was, it, it was absolutely right on the money. Mm -hmm. 
show. Yeah. My, my favorite quote from that movie is, man, you write out of a comic book. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Kelly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I know. <laughs> God. You know, the, <laughs> you probably don't want to put this on the tape, but I, I, I worked as a, a ticket terror at, a, at the Playboy Studio Cinemas in Cincinnati, Ohio, when I was wow. Oh, this is, definitely, this is definitely going on the tape, but go ahead. <laughs> you, you, you and Brad Holland, you know. <laughs> but I, I was... Uh, you know, tearing tickets, and on my first day, I had no clue. I didn't pay attention to what they were showing. I was hired because of um, uh, Last Tango in Paris. It had to be 18 years old to <laughs> yeah, work okay. the door. Yeah. And uh, uh, the first day that they were showing, when that left the theater and they were showing another movie, uh, all I could hear coming from the theater when they opened the doors was, Ooh, you know, all that <laughs> 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 kind of key eyeing all over the place. Right. Like, what the hell is that? And I walked in, and it was Enter the Dragon, and I just cracked up laughing because the way Bruce Lee would 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 scream like right, that. Right, right, yeah. right. He he would emote like nobody else. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. But he struck the fear in the hearts of men right before he kicked the hell out of them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Arts, um, and I hadn't realized that he was the same guy that played Cato yeah, until agree. years later, and you know, it went from there. But yeah, last two questions uh, for yeah. me, and, and these are these are not meant to be serious at all, Greg. So uh, okay, you know, uh, but we did notice a couple of hip hop artists in the uh, in the gallery on your website. And, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was wondering, are you a, are you a Fifty Cent kind of guy? Or are you a, a, a Tupac kind of guy? <laughs> <laughs> Say neither. <laughs> no, I, I, I'd have to say neither, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I, that was one of those times where, um, you know, the oil painters trying to be hip, I guess. Uh, actually, I, I enjoyed those those portraits quite a bit. Yeah. Um, you did a great job, uh, yeah. you know? Yeah. Oh, thanks, thanks. Yeah. I, I really, I didn't know much about them. I, I learned more because of the portraits. But um, I have to say that the... Uh, pieces on my website um, don't really do them justice, so okay. I, I can announce that I'm trying to work on updating my uh, website in a major way, so okay. I can have process shots and and get some new images scanned in there, and all the stuff we've been talking about can cool. go up there at some cool. point. So, okay. Okay. Yeah, but uh, uh, I have a granddaughter, and she's very much into rap, so. Right. Okay. Uh, I have to keep up, guys, you know. I understand. <laughs> I understand. You know. Uh, so I'm, I'm walking down the street now, humming that song, you know, Kiss Me Through the Phone. That's it. No! <laughs> no! I know. It's sad, isn't oh, it? Oh, not Soldier Boy. Oh. Soldier Boy. I don't know who it is, but oh, I don't like the sound geez. of it. Oh, yeah, I know. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I even I even know the words to some of Beyonce's music now. I mean, oh, I don't know well, what's wrong with me. Yeah, hey, you know. <laughs> anyway. No, no, no. Uh, I, I prefer Beyonce to Soldier Boy. If that's actually yeah, exactly, I think, it is. <laughs> yeah, I think I do too. And, and oh, once yeah. again, you're you're a credit to your to your evolution as an artist because you examine what's around you and you just yeah, adapt. Yeah, you know? stay, and stay connected. Well, so. There you go. You know, <laughs> I'm gonna race out and get the new Lady Gaga CD. Oh, oh, huh. Huh. Now, <laughs> now she's hot, so you know, <laughs> somewhere some, some, somewhere Michael Polzakis is very happy. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, last question, Greg, and this one actually is kind of serious, yeah. but s since you painted some of everything in your career, uh, yeah. uh, here's a question, and, it's, and this is one where time and history and reality, for that matter. All collide. Yeah, they, they collide and, and, and like don't even Like the new Star count. Trek movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you could be anything else other than a professional artist, would you be a pirate? Would you be a cowboy? <laughs> would, you be an, oh. would you be an astronaut, or would you be a superhero? <laughs> Oh, my God. Well, I can't pick one, but it's funny you should ask that because, yeah. uh, I mean, that was part of the thing that I thought about uh, when I got hit by that comment about my portfolio. Okay. And that was that I'm either going to paint and paint the way I want to see it or I'm going to be an astronaut. Now, it, it didn't matter at the time that I was 
I don't know, 30-something. <laughs> right. And they probably didn't want me in the least. But <laughs> I was either going to be a pilot or, uh, I mean, an astronaut or a fighter pilot. That's okay. what I figured. Okay. Uh, I went to art school because at the time, you know, I love to draw and I love art. But I also didn't want to be a grunt in the jungles of Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. I had heard that if you go to, go to school, that it could help you um, stay out of the draft yeah, and all that. And then I just, I just thought, if they come and get me, then I'm just going to walk down the recruiting office and, and become a pilot, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, in my first year in art school, uh, the war ended, and I, I didn't think about that stuff anymore. But oh. um, uh, there's a part of me that's kind of sad that I, I didn't do that because uh, I read about all these really great painters who went through the service and went through Vietnam and all that and right. came out, and and uh, they're doing great. Yeah. They, they got to do them both. Of course, as everybody knows, you know, war is just uh, the, luck of the luck of the draw if you mm. get through it, yeah. you know? Yeah. Not really about being a hero. Uh, sure. And probably illustration isn't about being a hero either. <laughs> it's just about painting. Okay. <laughs> like I said, it's not rocket science, but we sure love to think of it that way. But yeah. uh, I tend to go at it from a gut level and let that crawl up into the brain from there. Mm. And uh, I think that uh, the work has uh, – I've been able to to grow uh, faster and better from that point of view than trying to over-intellectualize the process, I think. Mm. So, okay. But I, I am still a fanboy of so many people. I mean, all, I, that entire list that you guys have on there, and I, you know, I've got a list of people I constantly look at, and it's as long as my arm. Mm. Uh, but I can go to a show and see bad painting, and still be inspired to paint. Mm. So mm. everything goes in, you know. Mm. Interesting. And, uh, I wish we could end on a really cool note, but there you go. No, well, 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 no, no. and I was going to say that you talk about, you know, being an illustrator is not about being a hero, but, I mean, we got a chance to talk to one of our heroes today, so mm-hmm. so that, that's cool. Oh, that's you cool. guys, man. Yeah. That's, well, I seriously. appreciate that. Seriously. I, I love the fact that you're looking. I mean, I, I really have only gotten just to this point in my life and figured out that, um, uh, you know, I guess this is what I wanted to do. <laughs> so I just got to paint now. <laughs> that concludes this episode of Sidebar Forever, hosted by Dwight Clark, Swain Hunt, and Adrian Johnson. You can find us online at sidebarforever.com. Any emails or questions can be directed to us at sidebarforever at gmail.com. And also, subscribe to us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram.